Welcome everyone, welcome. Um, we have gathered here today to have a conversation around shared decision making in healthcare. I think this is increasingly an important, complex and also very much advocated process. And uh, we hope that today's conversation will help us uh, increase our understanding uh, in this area. Maybe uh, we can start off by introducing ourselves. Um, my name is Dr. Yu Tong Wei. I'm a senior consultant at the National University Hospital. Elil? I'm Elil from the Sing Health Patient Advocacy Network, and I'm a double cancer survivor. Hi, I'm Dr. Sumitra Menon. I'm the Deputy Director at the NUS Centre for Biomedical Ethics. Thank you, thank you. So maybe we can start by um, sharing our perspective of what comes to mind when we talk about shared decision making in healthcare. Uh, perhaps we can start with you, Elil. So, well, for me, right, uh, shared decision making is uh, a back and forth between the doctor and myself, where I feel empowered uh, to make decisions instead of having uh, things uh, forced upon me, right? And based on my experience, it should be a dialogue or a relationship with the doctor. There have been a lot of times where I find that a doctor doesn't really care um, and it looks like they see me as being less than them. With shared decision making, I feel more respected uh, that the, the doctor really cares what matters to me. And so I'm more inclined to place my trust in doctors who do this. Um, that actually sounds very familiar and I think it happens a lot in clinical practice. Not that. Uh, doctors or healthcare professionals don't care, but um, yeah, sometimes we are too engrossed in recommending the, 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 the so-called right decision from our point of view. And sometimes, even I myself sometimes am guilty of this, uh, we forget to, to listen to the patient's stories and first understanding the values and the priorities. Um, what, what, what do you think of uh, Elio's take on shared decision making, Zoe? It's certainly very interesting you know, hearing directly from a patient perspective. I mean, there are various definitions of shared decision making. It is a contested term in how people might understand it. But generally speaking, it is understood as a series of conversations that you might have between the doctor and the patient. Um, and sometimes the patient prefers to have a loved one, it could be a family member or a close friend, also participate in that process. Somebody who can support them and um, you know, foster their autonomy, perhaps a sounding board uh, to be present in, in the process when they are um, exploring the patient's values, beliefs and concerns. And in turn, I think that helps the doctor to be able to better understand the patient and their needs and address those concerns and offer evidence-based treatments that you know, the patient can consider so that they can evaluate those options together and then hopefully come up with a decision that would be the best for that particular patient. Mm, sounds like a, like a collaborative process, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, I think that's the whole idea, is that it is a collaboration where the doctor is bringing their expertise as the clinical expert, if you like, um, uh, and also, of course, the doctor's experience of having treated and cared for patients in the past, and the patient is an expert on themselves and their life and their preferences and values. And so it's a combination of uh, those elements, which we hope, you know, is part of that shared decision-making process and will lead to, uh, hopefully, you know, a decision and outcome that will be uh, optimal for the patient. So doctors as experts in the medical field and uh, patients as experts in their own lives. I like that kind of a uh, paradigm. As Elil may have experienced in the past, not all patients are prepared or feel relaxed enough to be able to share about their life circumstances and their concerns. Um, they may have certain fears about speaking up or they may not have had enough time to reflect on what questions or concerns that they might have. Um, sometimes perhaps our healthcare systems are not set up in such a way to encourage patients and their loved ones 
to be able to articulate these um, concerns. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts about that. I agree. Um, I think sometimes the previous experience of uh, patients interacting with the healthcare system uh, might um, sort of might have conditioned them to think that doctors are maybe not interested to listen to issues outside of the so-called medical issues. Um, although this has slowly changed, I think, in a positive way, but patients may not um, be prepared or, um, uh, uh, or, or they, they, they don't have the time or the space or the, 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 the insight uh, to these changes. Mm. I think doctors then play a very important role to tell patients this clearly and enable them to voice out um, their values, concerns, priorities, goals, and so on and so forth as really relevant to their lives. And um, although there are limitations, time is a big thing that we hear all the time. Uh, but I think the first thing that as healthcare professionals we need to do is to embrace this paradigm. If we really embrace this at heart, I think we will then find ways to you know, make some modifications or maximize the time that we have to do this so that patients are then enabled to participate actively in the shared decision making. I think, you know, uh, my experience is um, there was this occasion when I had to receive some very bad news from the doctor. Um, as he was telling me these things, um, nothing was going in, right? Uh, I was in a state of shock. So everything just flew by. And I was very fortunate that a nurse later came in and explain things to me very clearly. And not only that, she also acknowledged my emotions. So that helped me take everything in. And this is not something that is very common. It, it was entirely by chance that it happened. Sometimes we, because of our training or because of the constraint times, we listen to respond and forget to acknowledge the the emotions, or we forget to listen to understand instead of responding immediately. I think probably that would help in um, getting the patient into a better situation to do a shared decision making. Well, yes, Elo, I think that's why it's so important to build a relationship of trust between the healthcare professionals, the patient, and you know the patient's loved ones as well. And, and that trust is built on very important values such as compassion, empathy, understanding, uh, and patience probably. Um, you know, when someone is unwell, um, especially if they're critically unwell, there is a lot of information that the healthcare professionals need to convey to patients and their loved ones. And, you know, in the moment with, with all that emotion and shock, it's unsurprising that a lot of the information doesn't register. So I think what's really important, as you've mentioned, is to create these opportunities where patients can easily come back and speak to the doctors or other healthcare professionals um, and say, you know, I've had time to reflect on this and I've got a list of questions or I have some concerns um, that, that I'd like to to discuss with you. And, and hopefully, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm confident this is going to happen in the future, that, that healthcare professionals will indeed um, be understanding of patients' needs and, and you know, engage with them about their concerns. I think that's really important because in order for us to really deliver care to the patient that's meaningful to them, um, where they feel part of the process rather than apart from it, that sort of engagement is going to be really essential. And, you know, it, it's, the, it's, it's that value or um, trust and understanding that's built over time, which will hopefully empower everybody involved. But um, to some healthcare professionals and even patients, um, a shared decision making might be a, a relatively new um, concept or paradigm. Um, 
and uh, some patients may be a little bit confused even uh, about what shared decision making is. So I think as, as a system and, and the healthcare professionals, uh, we need to um, be mindful of that and create that condition to support um, patients and, and let them know that we are trying to, to, to do this and to, to make this happen uh, in that sense. So I, I totally agree, right? Um, sometimes we feel that the doctors don't have time to listen to us. And as patients, when we are suddenly put on the spot, right, uh, we really don't know what to share and how to share it. So it will really help if the doctors can provide us with the space and the encouragement uh, for us to do so. Yeah. Maybe some preparation materials even before coming in and things like that might help. So I'm an endocrinologist, so I deal with a lot of um, long-term conditions, in particular diabetes, right? And there are other long-term conditions like heart failure, chronic obstructive lung disease. So for these kind of situations, I think there is a, already a, a, a doctor-patient relationship that's built over time. And I think it's a little bit easier to engage in shared decision-making. What about... Um, situations like when it's a, it's a short interaction or if it's the first time that we're seeing a person or a very limited um, um, subacute um, or even acute kind of uh, clinical situation. That can be very challenging, especially if the parties don't know each other, right? And um, when it's something of short duration or acute or subacute, as you mentioned, a patient might also be in more shock or surprise and then you know, n not so um, understanding or aware of what it is that they may have to share. So this in some part could be a systemic issue uh, because these sorts of interactions tend to be short and, um, you know, obviously healthcare professionals' time is, is a big issue, as we've already mentioned. So in that short space of time, there might not be enough of an opportunity to build um, that sort of relationship of trust and understanding. So in addition to the systemic challenges, I've been obviously trying to eke out a bit more time to, to have the, those conversations might be a way around it. But the other thing hopefully is, um, depending on how the situation goes, perhaps there could be an opportunity for a return appointment or even just saying to the patient, you know, please email me or here's a number that you can call if you have any concerns or questions might be, you know, enough of an encouragement so that if something does come up later, they can get back in touch. I think at, at the, in the very uh, limited time, it, it sort of routes back to what we have discussed just now. If we can very quickly um, try and understand what is the, the burning concerns or priorities, maybe that would help a little as well. Mm, let's, let's come back to long-term conditions. So we mentioned uh, uh, dialogues and conversations between the doctor and the patient, right? Um, what about family members? What, what do you think the role and to what extent should family members be involved in this shared decision-making? Well, I mean, Singapore is a very family-centric um, society, isn't it? Uh, so I think for long-term conditions, it would be ideal if patients are encouraged to uh, nominate or bring along um, a, a trusted family member or other loved one, or you know, if they don't have any family members, a close friend who can be with them through this process. That person, I think, can play many roles, um, apart from offering emotional support. They can you know, help to take notes and then, you know, reflect and have conversations with the patient about what might be important um, because, you know, the patient may forget sometimes what they would like to ask and then the family member, with the permission of the patient, can chime in and say, oh, you know, what about this, for example. That that might help the process as you're having these discussions with, with the healthcare professionals. But we must also be aware that, you know, for some patients, they really don't want someone to be involved. And there may be a number of reasons for that. Um, so, you know, 
if, if that is the case, we're obviously going to have to respect that decision. I mean, maybe that will change over time. Um, but yeah, if the patient is adamant that they, they do not want anybody involved, then that, that's something we're, we're going to have to um, work with on them. And I, I agree. Uh, my wife was very involved in my, my treatment. She accompanied me for most of my appointments. But uh, for the more routine ones, she wasn't there. And so there's this particular time where uh, I received some really troubling news. And it would have been a great help if she had been there at that time, right? So perhaps uh, the, the doctors and the nurses can uh, inform the patient that if it's going to be like a serious condition, uh, you know, and to tell them in advance that they should bring along, you know, someone, a loved one for their particular appointment so that it could be of help when this uh, troubling news is delivered to the patient. So, so in my practice, uh, I, I very frequently involve patients' family and uh, most of the time it helps, like what you mentioned and what you've shared, it, it helps increase the trust or the, the sense of being secured with someone love, that you love uh, being present in, in the consultation or the conversation. Um, but um, there are times when the, um, the family members are the main ones that are involved in decision making. And sometimes I struggle with that and I'm a little bit troubled sometimes because potentially they may violate the, 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 the patient's autonomy. Uh, but on the other hand, there are patients who are very comfortable in sort of like handing over the, the decision making entirely, almost entirely, uh, to the family members. What are your thoughts? Oh, well, I think it's a very tricky situation. And it, it does depend on the dynamic within that particular family. Um, you know, family members can have a, you know, a very positive uh, autonomy supporting effect on the patient, right? Um, but there could also be cases where family members can diminish the autonomy of, of the patient. And in many ways, the healthcare professionals are the ones who are best placed to observe those interactions and you know, to see if there, there could be something of concern. Um, if family members you know, have a tendency to belittle or be overly negative to the patient, then that might be a, a sort of warning alarm bell that something's not quite right. And in those situations, it could be that the patient either feels they have no choice but to sort of go ahead with what the family is proposing. Uh, that could be for, for many reasons, right? And I think that's uh, in a way what the healthcare professionals should um, observe and try to find ways to mitigate this sort of a potentially negative kind of influence, but but it's not easy, and uh, you know it's not a one size fit fit all kind of of situation. I do know of people who prefer not to make serious medical de decisions; they leave it entirely up to the doctor. What about them? Well, um, well, definitely there are situations like that uh, that we come across. For serious illnesses, if the patients totally don't want to sort of be the one to, to be involved in the decision making, it can be challenging because it's inconsistent with uh, shared decision making. Mm. But I do understand that some patients can feel shy or feel very pressured when they're invited to be part of the decision actively. Um, I've come across uh, some literature recently uh, that says that there are some, some um, um, shared decision-making nudges that can help us um, first understand uh, what are the reasons behind the reviews of, of uh, participation and also how can we better understand their values and preferences. Could you elaborate on that, Sumi? Nudges, again, is another area that can be quite contested um, because uh, gentle nudges, I think, are, are, are generally okay uh, because it's a form of encouragement and patients then and their family members, if they're involved, can then be free to either refuse or accept them. 
So um, gentle nudges might be an educational aid or patient information sheet about treatment options. Um, so, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, but, you know, a, a, a sort of, I suppose, more sophisticated way of doing it, if, if, if it's possible within the circumstances, is to kind of tailor the treatment options according to that particular patient. So, for example, um, if the patient is keen to make a family event like a wedding, um, then it could be that your nudge or your treatment plan could be tailored in a way to suit that goal which they're trying to make. So that might mean that you might be offering a treatment option that perhaps is less restrictive so that they can go and attend the event rather one that perhaps, um, you know, they either have to be at home or in bed or in a hospital. So, you know, that that is a possibility. Um, but obviously you have to present that option, but it's a little bit more sophisticated because it meets their values and needs. But I mean, ideally, I'm hoping we, we, we would move in that direction. And in that way, actually, when we do meet their needs, then they're more likely to come on board anyway with the treatment options that we are presenting at, you know, as possibilities to the patient and their family. And to close the loop about your query in relation to patients who do not want to be involved in the shared decision-making process, obviously that's not ideal, but patients will have their reasons for you know, not wanting to be involved. So in, in that sort of case, obviously the risks and benefits will have to be weighed and combined with whatever knowledge that you might have about the patient's preferences in order to come to a decision that you think would be in the patient's best interests. What about patients who are more confident in health literate? They don't want to involve others as much and they want to exercise their full autonomy. I, I've had a, a, a lot of patients who are like that. Actually, the experience can be very fulfilling because these patients are really activated. They are not a mere passive uh, player, if you like, um, in that whole process. And they are actively looking for information, asking good questions, and that, in a sense, also, you know, leads me to, to broaden my, my thinking when recommending uh, treatment options and, and, and ways to manage the situation, um, even to, to alternatives or non, non-conventional methods beyond just the medical things and involve more things that are related and uh, that are relevant to their daily lives. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if they're really not involving people around them, that can sometimes be a challenge as well. And uh, sometimes problems can arise. Well, that's sort of where the narrow and broad conceptions of shared decision-making come in. A narrow conception focuses on the individual in a very narrow sense that looks at how to stop interfering with their own choices. So it's kind of like going into a restaurant and somebody gives you a menu and you pick from a selection of options. In that way, the waiter's not really had any kind of involvement in directing the guest into perhaps choosing the special of the day or uh, perhaps, you know, this particular uh, seafood dish. Um, because the, the, that particular fish has come in fresh this morning. So that sort of non-interference where you're just giving treatment options is a very narrow kind of vision of what the role of a healthcare professional should be. A broader conception will look at the healthcare professional as somebody that engages more actively with the patient. And it becomes this discussion where they're talking about the different treatment options. Obviously, here we're talking about treatment options that are evidence-based and could be appropriate for the patient. And then in the process of that discussion, weighing up the pros and cons of each of those options with the patient, rather than leaving it entirely to themselves to decide on their own. The broader conceptions of shared decision-making also work particularly well where there's more than one feasible treatment option available. 
for those with compromised mental capacity and for people whose health literacy might not be especially high. Now, if we compare that with the narrower conceptions of shared decision making, one could say that, well, it was, it's, it's really designed to kind of um, contrast against the old system of doctor knows best. So the narrow conceptions kind of work better for patients who are particularly confident um, in articulating what they would like to say and those perhaps with a higher um, health literacy so that, you know, they kind of know what they want and are, are happy to express it. So again, there might be a little bit of friction if what the patient confidently has chosen is perhaps what the doctor is um, not so sure would be the optimal way uh, or treatment path for this particular patient. And in that case, I suppose, you know, depending on how strongly the doctor feels about it, a conversation could be had between them to perhaps come to some sort of solution. It may be, of course, that the patient is going to stick with their decision, but perhaps, um, depending on what it is, the the doctor might be able to convince the patient to try something else. So what about situations where there's only one treatment option presented to the patient as the acceptable option? Um, in this situation, the, the so-called only one option, most of the time it refers to medical options that are either evidence-based or in the doctor's opinion, it is the, treat, the only treatment that's available. For example, let's say in a, in a, in a situation where there is a cancer and uh, say a certain chemotherapy is the only one that has been shown by the available evidence to work in that sense, um, we may judge it as uh, both the patients and doctors may see that as the only viable option. But actually, um, uh, there are other options, just that they are not the so-called medical options and they are, they are, they are broader options. For example, um, palliative options, if they uh, decide not to go forward with the only available chemotherapy. So in, in, in these situations, if we think broader, um, um, we will find um, other non-conventional options. And, and that also uh, will, will be a, an important area to sort of perform this kind of shared decision making. So in the case that you just mentioned, um, shared decision making would involve the physician presenting the chemotherapy option alongside the option for palliative care or, of course, not having treatment at all. Right? And that will have to be considered through the prism of the patient's own values, beliefs and, and preferences. And with that information, then it can be combined in a way to consider those three options and then what would be best for the patient bearing in mind their own values and belief systems. So this information could be used cumulatively and then weighed to determine what would be the best option for this particular patient. In situations where physicians feel very strongly that there is a preferred treatment option, that option can indeed be presented to the patient with all, of course, of the risks and benefits um, to the patient so that they can consider it for evaluation. But in a collaborative shared decision-making model, the physician will also have to raise the other possible treatment options to the patient. And they certainly can't exclude them, even though they strongly believe that there is a preferred one. And those will also have to be presented neutrally to the patient so that they can consider and evaluate those for themselves. I mean, a shared decision-making process will actually involve and needs to involve the patient. So that's why all of the feasible treatment options need to be given to the patient for them to consider, right? It's not really shared decision making if you're just presenting the one thing 
that you as the healthcare professional thinks that the, the, the patient um, should actually be doing. So that's a really critical part of, of the process. And when you take that into account alongside the patient's own values, beliefs and preferences, then hopefully a decision uh, you know, that, that they will be comfortable with and they feel are confident in doing is the one that you will proceed with. Just because a treatment looks good on paper doesn't mean it's going to suit that particular patient. And shared decision making is shown you know, through evidence-based studies that have been conducted to enhance the relationship between um, the physician and, and the patient and, and improve trust. So Adil, I don't know whether you might have some thoughts about that. So I think, like I said earlier, right, it's all about empowering the patient all right, to make decisions. So um, even if there's only one uh, option, one treatment option available, this dialogue must still take place between the doctor uh, and the patient uh, so that they can, they can accept the decision by themselves instead of being pressurized into accepting the option because it's the only way. For example, uh, giving a parent time to grieve before taking the child off life support. This will give them time to process, right? And, and this can help immensely. These um, models and theories are, are all very idealistic. But we do know that uh, every person is different. They will have their own quirks. Families will have different dynamics. How, how do we best put this into practice? So sometimes what the doctor feels is best for the patient may not be consistent with the patient's uh, autonomous decision. right? And sometimes what the family thinks is best for the patient uh, may not be the same as what the doctor or the patient themselves feel. And so, I understand that there may be uh, different conflicts between doctor, patient and the family, especially when the uh, patient prefers limited participation and, um, and then the, the family uh, wants to make the decision even when the patient has the capacity to do so himself. Right? So, all these bring out different challenges. And I think we need, um, you know, to have this discussion on how to resolve these issues in shared decision making. Um, and and they're, going, they're not going to be easy. Yeah. The solutions, I think, depend on the circumstances. Generally speaking, communication that is clear, empathetic and consistent will help patients and their loved ones if they're involved if there are any conflicts in relation to this shared decision-making process. Um, hopefully with that, you will arrive with some sort of compromise that you can move forward with. So that is very true. Many of us are both patients and caregivers, right? And it's very difficult uh, for us to put ourselves in each, each other's shoes. And um, Singapore being such a... a you know, family-centric society, it is not very common to find them discussing such issues openly, right? So it is very important that uh, we have open communications and discussions uh, with the doctors and that this can bring about positive change in this, this dynamic. Uh, our conversation so far is really fruitful and informative, but unfortunately we have to come to a close. Um, hopefully, we are all um, better enlightened in regards to shared decision making. And with that, I thank both of you for your valuable discussion and input. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.